This is one of the series of our anatomy videos, and the session will be about the face and scan. At the part of the anatomy of the neck, this is about the face and scan. We'll start by the scalp anatomy. And the layers of the scalp are five layers, starting from the skin, the connective tissue deep to it, the abnormal layer, the loose connective tissue, a layer of loose connective tissue, and lastly, the preosteum or the pericranium. The first three layers are very tightly held together to form what a single unit. This, this is the tissue torn away during serious scalping injuries. During the injuries of the scalp, those three layers will come together. So starting by the skin, it is a thick hairy with numerous spacious glands. Obstruction of these spacious glands usually ends up by forming what we call spacious cysts. Those cysts usually move with the scalp. The second layer, the connective tissue, which is a very tough layer attaching the skin to the underlying abneurosis. It has the, rich, the richest octaneous blood supply in the body. The third layer is the abnormal layer, which is the thin tendinous sheet that unites the frontal and the occipital bellies to form what we call the occipital frontalis muscle, and is attached laterally to the temporal fascia. The fourth is the loose areolar tissue which occupy the subabneurotic sub space and contains few arteries and very important emissary veins. The last is the pericranium, which is the deepest layer. It represents the preosteum of the outer surface of the clavera, as the sutures become continuous with the preosteum on the inner surface of these bones. The muscle of the occipital frontalis muscle, muscle of the scalp, is formed of two pillars, the occipitalis, which arise from the highest nuchal line and pass severely to be inserted to the epicranial aponeurosis. That is the epicranial aponeurosis here. The frontalis, which is the anterior one, arises from that part of the epicranial aponeurosis, this one here be inserted in the skin over the eyebrows. The action, it is a muscle of surprise, muscle of, of expression, surprise or error. The blood supply of the skull will come from the arteries which are in front of the auricle, which are the supratrocular, the supraorbital, superficial temporal. Behind the auricle, there will be the posterior auricular artery and the occipital artery. The veins will be dealt with with the face when we come to the venous drainage. Of As for the nerve supply of the skull, the sensory from two main sources, the trigeminal and the cervical nerve, second and third. The motor from the facial nerve. There is five in front of the auricle, which are the supratrocular, supraorbital, zygomaticotemporal, and auriculotemporal. All of these are sensory. The only motor is the temporal branch of the facial nerve. Behind the auricle, we have the great auricular, the lesser occipital, the greater occipital nerve, the third occipital nerve, and the only motor will be the busiricular branch of the facial nerve. Now we are going to study the face, the muscles, the nerves, and the vessel.
Uh, the facial muscles, they are flat muscles connected to the derms of the skin to be muscles of expression, innervated by the facial nerve, all of them. There's many variations uh, between uh, these muscles and often they blend with each other. Relaxed skin tension lines run perpendicular to the direction of the muscle fiber. These are the main features of those muscles. About the muscle, we start by one of the important muscles of the face. We are going to concentrate on three of them. The first one is the buccinator muscle, that muscle over here. Its origin is from three parts, the upper fibers from the maxilla above the molar teeth, the lower fibers from the brick line of the mandible below the lower molar teeth, and the middle fibers comes from the trigomandibular raffi. The insertion of the muscle, the muscle fibers, the upper one will go to the upper lip, the lower will go to the lower lip, while the middle will take a seat at the angle of the mouse. Those of the upper part will go to the lower lip, and those of the lower fibers will go to the upper lip to the cassette at the angle of the mouse. The action is to compress the check against the teeth and gums during mastication, and this prevents the dribbling or the accumulation of saliva and food in the vestibule. It assists the tongue in direction food between the teeth. If the muscle blowing, suckling, kissing, whistling, and so on, it keeps the mouse orifice in the middle line by the equal pull of the two muscles on each side. That is the buccinator muscle. The second muscle is the orbicularis oculi muscle, <coughs> which is this muscle around the orbit here. <coughs> it's formed of three parts, an orbital part, the circle here, and this <coughs> arises from the nasal side of the frontal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla with the medial palpebral ligament. The fibers form a complete circle, as we can see here, to come back <coughs> with no bone attachment on the lateral side, to come back to the same parts of the origin. The action is forced closure of the eye. <clears throat> the second part is the palpebral part, the one in the upper and the lower eyelids, <clears throat> and those arise from the medial palpebral ligament with the bone immediately close to them. <clears throat> the fibers will go across and ends in the lateral palpebral raffi. The action is gentle closure of the eye. The third part of the muscle is the lacrimal part. And this arises from the upper part of the lacrimal crust and the adjacent side of the lacrimal bone and pass laterally behind the nasolacrimal sac where it is inserted into the associate fascia of that sac. The action is to dilate the, lac the lacrimal sac to create a negative pressure inside so it helps in suction of the tears. The second muscle or third muscle is the orbicularis oris, the muscle around the mouse orifice. And this arises from the tissues around the mouse and mainly continuation of the fibers of the buccinator muscle. It blends with that and it's formed part of that muscle, the orbicularis oris. It helps in shaping of the lips as during speech. Here we'll come to a quick summary of the muscles of the face, just to know the names of them and their distribution. So we know the names, the actions, and the nerves supply all of them from the facial nerve, as we said. So the first are the forehead muscles, which are the frontalis muscle, the frontal pili, that elevates the brow and supplied by the temporal 
branching the facial, or these are branching the facial. The bursorious muscle, which is this muscle here, which depress the bra. The corrugator superciliae, this muscle here, which again depress the bra. Orbicular circuli, which we have described in details. The lip muscles are in groups. Group one is the orbicular sphoris, which we have talked about, and this grow the mouse. The buccinator muscle, this muscle here, which is a very important one, as we said. Resorious muscle, which is this one, it elevates the commission. And the breast or angli oris, this one here, which the breast and move laterally the commission. And the zygomaticus major muscle, this one here. which elevates and moves again laterally the commission. This is the group, first group. Second group will be the levator labii superioris. This inserted in the upper lip, this group. The levator labii superioris, which elevate the upper lip. The levator labii superioris aliquinizae, which dilates the nostrils and elevate the upper lip. Diagmatic spinal, which is this one here, which again elevate and bulge in the commission. The third group, which is inserted in the lower lip, is the depressor labii inferioris, this muscle here. The mentalis muscle, which is this muscle here. And this is the platysma. The last one, all of them will depress the lower lip. The nose group are the nasalis muscle, which compress and dilate the nose. The depressor septinizae, which depresses the tip of the nose. And elevator labii superioris, a liquid again, which, as we said, dilate the nostrils and elevate the upper. The nerve supply of the face comes from the, the, the trigeminal nerve mainly, and from the second cervical. These are the areas which are the cutaneous supply of the face, showed by different colors, yellow, blue, and pink. The ophthalmic is this one, that's the area supplied by the ophthalmic. And this is the area by the maxillary. This is the area by the mandibular. And the last one is the area by the great auricular nerve, mainly the second segment, cervical segment. Now the nerve supply of the face, there is sensory supply, which are the branch of trigeminal, except the areas we said around the angle of the mandible by the second cervical. Branch from the ophthalmic division are the supratrocular, the supraorbital, the bulbibular branch of the lacrimal nerve, the infratrocular, and the external nasal. From the mandibular division will be the mental, the buccal nerve, and the auriculotemporal. From the maxillary will be the facial, the temporal, and infratemporal. As for the motor, all the branches or the supply of the motor all the muscles of the face except the levator bulbibris superioris, which is a part supplied by the oculomotor nerve. Now, the facial nerve, which is the main motor supply of all the muscles of the face, that is the trunk within the parotid gland after removal of the parotid gland, the main trunk and its branches. It innervates the muscle to facial expression and it comes out through the sylomastoid foramen to enter the parotid gland where it ends by dividing its terminal five branches. The temporal branch, this is the one, the zygomatic, the buccal, both of them, and the marginal mandibular, and the cervical. These are the one which are found the face. Behind the auricle, there is the posterior auricular nerve which supplies the occipitalis muscle and the muscles of the ear. The arterial supply of the face will come from branch of the external carotid 
and the internal carotid. Branch of the external carotid are from the facial artery, which you can see over here and over here, superficial temporal, which goes up this one here, and the maxillary artery, the one which goes to the infratemporal fossa. Branch of the internal carotid from the ophthalmic artery. The branches from the external carotid artery, which is this one here and here, the facial artery, which will give the inferior labial, the superior labial, the nasal or lateral nasal, and end as the angular artery. From the superficial temporal, which is this one, and the transverse facial, the zygomatic orbital artery, these are branch of the superficial temporal and the middle temporal artery. With the auricular artery, which goes to the auricle. The maxillary artery will give the infraorbital artery, which is the large artery, and the buccal artery. These are the branches which comes from the external carotid and the mental artery. The branches from the internal carotid artery are the ophthalmic artery, mainly, which gives supratrochular, supraorbital, lacrimal artery, which will give the medial palpebral arteries. These are the arteries which come from the ophthalmic artery, together with the elevator palpebral or the lateral palpebral arteries, with the external nasal arteries. The venous drainage of the face is as follows. The supraticular vein and the supraorbital vein will unite to form the anterior facial vein, while the maxillary will unite with the superficial temporal to form the retromandibular vein. The retromandibular vein will divide into anterior division and posterior division. The anterior division will unite with the anterior facial to form the external, the common facial vein, while the posterior division will unite with the posterior auricular to form the external jugular vein, which will end in the subclavian, while the common facial will end in the internal jugular vein. That is a cadaveric picture for those veins which show that is the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the external acoustic meatus is here, that is the masseter muscle, that is the deep part of the parotid gland. So this is the superficial temporal vein, and this is the maxillary vein, uniting to form the retromandibular, which is divided into a deer division, to join the facial nerve forming the common facial, while the posterior division, the posterior regular, will join the posterior, uh, posterior division to form the external jugular vein. The venous communications of the face, which is very important, we have to know that the anterior fascia will communicate with the superior ophthalmic and the inferior ophthalmic, and both of them will go to the cavernous sinus. They will also communicate with the trigo to regard uh, venous plexus, this one here, which will go again to the cavernous sinus. The last thing is the lymphatic drainage. The groups are the occipital, the posterior auricular, the barotid group, the upper deep cervical, they, they go to the upper deep cervical, the submental, which will go to the submandibular 
and the submandibular will end in the upper deep cervical also. That's all about the facial scan.